Uh, without further ado, I uh, invite Paul Blow, Jim Duginio, and Oliver Stone to uh, join me on stage. <laughs> so welcome to you all. Thank you for being with us today. Um, we'll dive in pretty quickly to the subject matter. Uh, it's a uh, on invitation only event, so I think it's safe to assume that everyone who's here has a keen interest in the subject matter in the first place. So no need to tell you what happened on November 22nd, 1963 in Dallas. No need to tell you about the um, fact that Lee Harvey Oswald was picked up within 24 hours of the assassination, and that several months later, the Warren Commission, which had officially been appointed to investigate what had happened, uh, concluded that Oswald had acted alone in killing President John F. Kennedy, and that this version of facts, of the facts has been, shall we say, contested by some. So first, as a very general matter, um, we'll get more specific in a minute, I'd be curious to hear all three of you briefly explain your personal interest in the assassination, why you feel it remains an important, a highly important uh, topic today. Perhaps starting with you, Mr. Stone. I couldn't hear the last sentence. Okay. Why you feel that this um, subject matter is still very relevant, very important even today, some 50 years later. Well, you don't kill a president. It's a coup d'etat. November 63, and ever since then, the United States is different. Not one single U.S. president has ever taken on what John Kennedy tried to do and almost pulled off by changing the rules of the game. And this is in, not only in foreign policy, but also domestic policy. So it was a warning, it was given, and America has suffered ever since, going, continuing with a militarization of its society that is unbelievable war after war after war, no budget controls, the intelligence agencies are on their own, out of control. So that's where we are. That's why it's important. Okay. Well, in my opinion, JFK was the most liberal president since Franklin Roosevelt, all right? And at this point in time, at the peak of the Cold War, he was actually trying to do some things that did not sit well with the power elite. Like in the film, we showed the whole Vietnam, um, his policy there. We also showed lesser known things like Congo, all right? And these were very disturbing to some of the people who had grown up under John Foster Dulles and Eisenhower, all right? Since then, in my opinion, there hasn't been anybody you know, who has done those kind of things and was willing to go against the grain like he was. This is why, of course, that when you study the Kennedy presidency, by 1963, Bobby Kennedy is really the Secretary of State. Okay, because JFK doesn't want to go through, <laughs> you know, people like McGeorge Bundy, all right? And he doesn't trust these people. And so most of the things that he was doing by then Bobby Kennedy was like the roving ambassador. Since then, you know, what did Gore Vidal call it? What we have is a state that's perpetual war for perpetual peace. That's, that's the excuse for the military industrial complex, that we have to be at war all the time in order to be at peace, which we, of course, are not. It's an oxymoron, all right? And I also believe that uh, they made sure they don't get anybody even close to Kennedy again. That's how constricted the political spectrum has become. It's become a, a kind of warfare state since then. Paul. Uh, thank you. Um, for me, the Kennedy assassination is the biggest whodunit of the last century. I mean, who cannot be interested in that? And then what happened afterwards was what? Uh, if you look at the confidence uh, people have in the press today, or in politicians, it's at its lowest that I've ever seen. And you can trace that back to the Kennedy assassination. And of course, what followed? What did you get? Vietnam. 
then you had the other murders in the 60s of Martin Luther King and, and of course, Bobby Kennedy. And next thing you know, you have uh, uh, Iran-Contra, Watergate. And so the American public just felt, that, and everybody felt they were being lied to all the time. So if you don't analyze that moment in history and you don't understand what happened then, well, we're going to just repeat the same errors. And uh, it, I think it has an awful lot to do with the direction the country took. And it wasn't necessarily the best direction. Right. C can I comment on something he said? Sure. That's a very good observation. Because if you take a look at uh, a book by Kevin Phillips called Arrogant Capital, he charts. I'm sorry, if I can just, uh, just for a second. Are we talking about the Kevin Phillips who was an advisor to uh, President Nixon? The same Kevin Phillips? He was an, yeah, an advisor to, to Richard Nixon, Nixon, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. He has a chart in that book which shows a decline of people's belief in their government. Okay, from about, I believe, if I remember, 1960 to about 1995. The one year steepest decline, it's like a toboggan, was 1964, which is when the Warren Commission was issued. All right? So since then, you've had, a, you know, a, a populist that simply has lost confidence in their, in their government. And there's a parallel one you can do with belief in the media that's pretty much the same. So in, in my opinion, as we show in the film, as David Talbot, the uh, author of uh, a couple of very good books on the assassination said, you know, the, the kind of mud fight that you have in the United States today is due to the fact that nobody believes in those two institutions anymore. All right? <clears throat> so in the film, you talk about the chain of custody, the issue of uh, witnesses like Victoria Adams uh, and their testimonies basically being um, either shredded or dismissed or ignored, willfully ignored, so on and so forth. There's, there's a lot of material that you touch on, obviously. If you had to boil it down, and I, I'll tell you in advance, it's almost an impossible question, but if you had to boil it down to one thing, if you had to make your case for the single biggest um, argument in favor of, well, the argument that Lee Harvey Oswald did not act alone and that this was, in fact, part of a larger plot in Dallas. If you had to boil it down to one well, argument. Exactly point, isn't it? Yeah. That, uh, it's, we can always, you can only, it's, an, it's like, it requires a Sherlock Holmes to solve this case. Right. It's an accumulation of detail. And I've been there because I didn't know anything about it until 1987. And I've accumulated these details over many years. And that's the problem. Uh, you, you can't explain it to a one easy soundbite for a, a television station. Uh, you know, you could argue that uh, the autopsy is the single clearest evidence of more than one shooter. Right. And uh, certainly that's a good starting point, but there's so much more detail that's lost. So we never investigated the case at all. It was, it was investigated, but so poorly. And the communication between the agencies were so confused, as it is in big government, that the details, as, as Mark Lane said once when they criticized him continuously, he said, Mr. Mr. Lane, do you have any new evidence? Because we're kind of bored with the old. He says, well, no, what's wrong with the old evidence? You know, this is the way people think. They always want something new. They, they want to turn the page. They want something exciting. And that's the problem you're dealing with a fickle public. Right. Well, if you saw the film, we spent a lot of time on two specific pieces of evidence. Uh, CE-399, the magic bullet, and Kennedy's brain. Uh, chain of custody, I think we did a very good job, if I say so myself, pat myself on the back. You did. You know, I can we, tell you, you did. I think we did a very good job on this whole issue of chain of custody. Because as uh, Henry Lee, who, the foremost criminalist in the United States, he used to be an investigator. He used to be a captain. The 25-second speech that he gives in the film drives a stake through the heart of the Warren Commission. CE-399 would never in a million years be admitted into a court of law. But it's the sine qua non of the Warren Commission. Because if you don't have CE-399 doing all these 
I don't even want to talk about it. It's kind of funny. You know, smashing two bones, making seven holes, going through two men, you know, going into, you know, his thigh, sliding out on some stretcher, okay, which they really don't know what stretcher it is. If you don't have that, then w what the question becomes then is who planted the bullet, all right? Who planted that thing? And then you have a conspiracy. And that's what the Warren Commission didn't want to confront, okay? And so that's what I think is the most, the most significant piece of evidence. If you want to talk about one piece of evidence with including the questions of chain of custody, it's probably that. Uh, raise your hands, those of you who have seen the Zapruder film. Okay. Well, those of you who haven't seen it should take a look at it on YouTube tonight. And I mean, look, proof of a front shot. Okay, so proof of a front shot for me is way more than the Zapruder film. So what you have to imagine is what the Zapruder film, Zapruder was the dressmaker who filmed the assassination. Okay, and that, that film, they didn't want us to see it. They kept it hidden for 10 years. And the reason, and when people did see it, I mean, that started what? That started the HSC, did it not? Or anyway, it eventually led to that. But proof of a front shot. First of all, take what happened in Daly Plaza. Daly Plaza, out of about 100 witnesses, 50 of them, over 50, thought the shot came from the front. From the grassy knoll. From the grassy knoll behind the picket fence. Then you had another 20 or 25 about who thought they came from two places. That means there's a conspiracy. And then you had another 30 who thought it came from the depository, which there was probably shots that, that did come from there because there were many shooters. Now, that's, that's one element, okay? So you take the witnesses. Some witnesses smelled gunpowder when they went by the picket fence. Some saw a puff of smoke. Some people actually from behind, right, from the uh, rail yards, actually saw a flash of light from behind the picket fence. Now, flash forward, you go to Parkland. The, the amazing thing that happened to Kennedy is that he survived 45 minutes. He had his brains shot out, but he was still alive. And what they saw there in Parkland was a huge exit wound. And they all describe it, something like 20 people. How many people describe an exit wound in the back of uh, Kennedy's head? 20 at Parkland and 20 at uh, Bethesda. Okay, then, now flash forward a bit later, somebody recorded the assassination. It was on walkie-talkies, okay, and it was recorded, and there was acoustic evidence that came out that is contested, but the acoustic evidence showed they did echo analysis, and what the echo analysis proved that there were at least four shots. There was more likely five or even more, but they proved four, three from the Texas School Book Depository, and one from the picket fence. So if you, you can either believe that there's one lone nut who made all these hits, or that, ah, and I have another one. Someone actually, a police officer, went to the picket fence and saw an agent flashing secret su uh, service uh, a badge. But they were all accounted for, and none were behind the picket fence. That was an imposter. So they may have even come face to face with the killer, or one of the killers. Uh, so, if you ask me, the front shot uh, uh, evidence is overwhelming. So both, can, can, sure. I, he says about the acoustical evidence that there was four shots. There was not really four shots. There was really five shots. Why do we say four shots? Because the technician who talked to the chief counsel of that investigation, House Select Committee on Assassinations, 1978, Robert Blakey. He said, and I, I really want everybody to think about this, because we're talking about a murder case. You're talking about forensic evidence, you know, that will either acquit or find guilty. This is what he said. I'll never be able to sell five shots to the committee, so we have to cut it down to four. <laughs> All right? I mean, th I mean, is that the most preposterous thing you ever heard of? Okay, I'll, I'll never be able to sell that knife to the jury. I, let's use this knife, okay? <laughs> yeah, that's what that's like. 
And that's what's happened to the Kennedy case. So both JFK, the original movie that came out in 1991, and JFK Revisited that we're discussing today, essentially make a case for what did not happen, right? The Warren Commission's version of the facts is not the reality. Now, we're in 2022. So about three decades after JFK, the original movie came out, and JFK Revisited came out last year, after all this time, if you had to venture a single or a, a best estimation as to what you actually think happened, what would it be? At the end of, of the uh, JFK movie, there's a great sequence uh, with Jim Garrison basically making his case, right? And, and there's a, a short sequence within that larger sequence of him uh, briefly speculating as to what might have happened, right? Uh, three shooters, three rifles, possibly six shots, so on and so forth. So today, what do you think is most likely to have occurred? What do you want to start with? How about you, if you want? I'm the first one in. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, why, that's why you're sitting there. That's right. <laughs> Hot seat. Uh, I think th I tried in the film to give a picture of, of, of somewhat of what happened. Right. I would make one modification because it's clear to me now from the clues that I don't believe there was anybody on the sixth floor. Uh, that's because of the, seat, the three secretaries who were on the fourth floor and who rushed to the staircase. Nobody was there. Nobody was coming down. So there was no exit besides that staircase. That throws the whole thing into another perspective. There were, it obviously brings the Daltex building. We shot, as you remember the film, we put people in the Daltex building. And we also considered the rooftop of the county courthouse building. I forgot the name of it. The yeah, that's right, the Daltex building. Well, it doesn't matter. The point is, he was shot from two sides, the front and the back. So let's say no one's on the sixth floor. Oswald has nothing to do with it. He's a patsy, as he says. He's a set-up man. And uh, I take for granted his story, because it makes sense, the way he was used. All through the process you saw in the film of him, the CIA, the fingerprint, what Schweiker, Senator Schweiker called the fingerprints of intelligence are all over Oswald from the beginning, from 1959. So uh, aside from that, I think... We were very, I think we were pretty close on the film. I can't remember all the details. Uh, Jim would remember the, the details. Well, it's, you know, it's, even though Oliver got blasted back in 1991, but what he did, his reconstruction, I believe, is actually pretty close to what really happened. Oh. All right. Uh, if you read uh, Josiah Thompson's book, Last Second in Dallas, he actually went down to Dealey Plaza with a measuring instrument. And according to the uh, measurements of, of the back wound, he said it had to go back to the Dell Tex building. Okay, that, you know, and then, of course, you have the, uh, uh, when Kennedy gets his head blown off, I think most of us believe that that was from the grassy knoll, from, the, uh, from behind, there's a, if you've never been there, there's a, a picket fence that runs parallel to this street and then it indents this way and then at the corner of the picket fence there is a sewer underneath it okay that i've been there at that corner i believe that's where the fatal shot came from that rockets kennedy backward with such force that he literally bounces off the back seat okay you know and probably the third probably the third position was probably in the Texas School Book Depository, but not on that sixth floor, okay? You know, so I believe it's probably something like on the fifth floor or something. See, that, that building, what hardly anybody understands, well, let's put it this way. The ineptitude of the Dallas police was staggering in this case, all right? You talk about Keystone cops, you know? So they did not secure the building for something like 30 minutes, all right? Now, what Oliver's talking about, if you believe the Warren Commission, then Oswald has to be coming down those stairs because uh, the policemen and the supervisors see him on the second floor, all right? He literally has to be on those stairs at that time, all right? 
what we show in the film, which I believe is one of the best parts of the film, <laughs> is, is, when, is when we have a guy who wrote a book, The Girl on the Stairs. Not, there's not one witness. There's not two witnesses. There's three witnesses to that stairwell. And the most important one is the one that was hidden, Miss Garner, okay? Because she didn't go down the stairs. She stayed in the stairway. So how could she possibly miss Oswald flying down those stairs? All right, and they, and as we show in the film, and this is one of the, you know, the most disgusting parts of this whole business, is that the Warren Commission knew about her. Okay, they knew about her. J. Lee Rankin knew about her in June. They didn't close shop till September. Why did they not call her as a witness? And, and again, to get into the real world, the fantasy world of the Warren Commission, in the real world, if you hide exculpatory evidence, evidence that will acquit the client, do we have any lawyers here? <laughs> oh, well, okay. No. Oh. In the real world, if you do something like that, and if you get caught, the, the defendant will walk. All right, about 80% of the time, that's enough. And then if you add in the fraud that the Warren Commission did with CE 399, I guarantee the client will walk. All right. Paul, anything you want to add? Well, uh, I'm going to pivot a little. Uh, just say why it became such a mess. Because what you had there was triangulation of fire. You had a crossfire. Uh, but you see, the whole idea with Oswald and you can see that into the build-up to the assassination, is they wanted to link him to Castro agents. Mm -hmm. A uh, Okay, they wanted to link him to Castro agents, uh, Oswald. And, and they, they, you know, all sorts, the first stories that came out after the assassination was that Oswald was in cahoots with Castro. Mm -hmm. And that's why he was part of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. Okay, and they wouldn't have minded a front shot. They would not have minded, but that guy, you can be sure, that had they caught him, would have been Cuban connected. But then uh, uh, LBJ did not want to go that route. The missile crisis had taken place a year earlier, and he did not want to have a risk of a, a nuclear war. They said, no, we're going the lone nut route. A route. But the problem was, is the genie was out of the bottle. There's too many, uh, too many, uh, uh, elements of proof, evidence, that there was a front shot, there's a Pruder film, and that's why Jack Ruby had to, uh, you know, eliminate uh, Oswald really quickly. They didn't want him talking. Well, did you want to add something? No? I thought, okay. Uh, sp yes. Okay. The two best indications of a front shot, and we have one of them in the film, we have the other one in the long version of the film, the four-hour version of the film, is that there was a blasted out back right rear of Kennedy's skull. And 40 witnesses saw this. And they even drew pictures of it for the, uh, for the um, House Select Committee on Assassinations, which were hidden, which were hidden, okay, from the public until he came along with his movie and they forced her to de declassification of that evidence, all right? Now, anybody will, with any common sense will tell you if you have a blasted out back of the skull that you can fit an orange through, then it's more likely than not the shot came in from the front, okay, to carry all the tip. And he can tell you that because he was in the infantry, all right? Now, the second piece of evidence we have, which is in the long version, all right, is the fact that the larger particles in Kennedy's skull are towards the back of the brain, okay? The sh smaller, tiny ones are in the front. And any forensic pathologist will tell you that in a gunshot wound residue case, the larger fragments travel further. The shorter ones, because they have no force or mass, stay where the bullet came in, all right? That's why I say we proved that Kennedy was hit from the front. We have, and I'm very proud of the fact that we got all these doctors and we even got a neurologist, hmm. a neurologist, Mike Chesser, to talk about that. You know, he knows what he's talking about. Okay. Um, 
We uh, just mentioned both Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby. In the movie, there's talk of secret government memos regarding both. Can you, can you discuss those, what we know from these memos, what the government knew, what they wanted to know about both? How they knew it and how they knew it. Yeah. Uh, that would be Jim? Yeah. yeah. Jim, you give the details. Uh, Oswald and the Oswald Ruby memos? Yeah. And, and as well, and furthermore, uh, the link, or links, rather, between the CIA and Oswald, the extent to which the okay, CIA great, actually great. tracked Oswald for Terrific. years. Terrific. All right. <laughs> Even the Warren Commission knew two lawyers on the Warren Commission. One of them was Burke Griffin. They even wrote a memo saying the most likely connections between Oswald and Ruby are in the underworld of the anti-Castro movement, all right? This is like in 1964 they knew this, you know? And they wrote two memos about this and they, because they had evidence of Ruby showing up at these uh, meetings trying to raise money for the anti-Castro cause, all right? They did not, <laughs> needless to say, they didn't, they decided not to investigate that very much further after those memos came in. And the second author of the memo quit after that, all right? With Oswald and Ruby, what you have, of course, and Bobby Kennedy talks about it in the film, you have one guy who has a mark of the mob all over him, and as Schweiker said, the other guy has the fingerprints of intelligence all over him, all right? In other words, there's CIA and the mafia. And what Alan Dulles never told anybody on the Warren Commission is that he commissioned the CIA mafia plots to kill Castro, all right? Because that, of course, is a great nexus point. Now, let me very briefly say one thing that I believe is of the utmost importance, but unfortunately it didn't make it into the film. To show you just how connected Oswald was, there was a woman named Betsy Wolf who worked for the House Select Committee, 1977-1978. Her assignment was the Oswald file at the CIA. She asked for every charter in every division of the CIA, all right? Whether it be Soviet Russia division, whether it be covert action, et cetera, there's about seven or eight divisions. She read every single charter. And then she did a theoretical chart, a, a graph, where Oswald's file should have gone. And when she was done, she found out a very funny thing. It didn't do that. Oswald, Oswald, the graph of his file didn't do that at all. And she was stunned by that. And so she then got permission to call in all these guys and try and explain to her what the hell happened to Oswald's file. After her fourth interview, which came in late 1978, about two months before it closed down, she got a guy named Richard Gambino, who was the chief of the Office of Security at that time. And he t this is what he told her. It doesn't matter how stamped, how many divisions are stamped on the paper. It doesn't matter how many copies you have. If the client goes to what's called the Office of Mail Logistics, which is like the fulcrum point for everything coming into the CIA, it will go to that part of the CIA. And he, you know why he knew that? Because that's where Oswald's file went, into the Office of Security. So what this means is, to put it in shorthand, before Oswald even defected to Russia, Somebody was fiddling with his file at the CIA. They didn't want people in the CIA to know who he was or where he was going or who he was working for, okay? Betsy Wolf deserves a medal. She doesn't like talking about this case, any, which is understandable, considering the fact that her work was so explosive that Blakey did not even type it up in the memorandum form. I got it from a guy who d 
does all this archival work, and it's a good thing she had good penmanship, so I could read her handwriting. All right. <coughs> when were the memos released? What was what? When were those memos released? You know something? That's a good question. In the film, we I think in the long version, they talk about that even after the ARB shut down, they put dates on certain memos that they feel it could have been released at that point. To my knowledge, those, those documents did not get released till 2005, all right? And if it wasn't for the great Malcolm Blunt, who's one of the unsung heroes of this case, he sent them to me, okay? And that's, that's how I know that I, I, I can talk about this stuff. Anything but that isn't that stunning that we had to wait 40 years to find out that somebody in the CIA was rigging Oswald's file? Was that Angleton? What? Was that Angleton? That he was the guy who had access to those files, yes. Right. Maybe just chime in a little bit. Uh, when Oswald went to Russia, right? It was during a false defector program. And there were a number of Marines that went in like him. And the way you could tell the difference between a real uh, inquiry when there was a real defection is how seriously they took it. But when they tried to do the inquiry on Oswald, it was all superficial. Everybody who was asked questions, they said, well, they just lobbed softballs at us. And, and they, they didn't really dig much. The second thing, major mistake that happened is when he was in New Orleans, and this we see in the JFK movie, is he was distributing flyers for the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. Now that would be like uh, starting up the Fair Play for Al-Qaeda Committee after 9-11. It doesn't make <laughs> any sense, okay? So this guy is handing him out, and he puts an address on it, 544 Camp Street. That was a mistake, and that address put him right in the middle of, I mean, the intelligence network of New Orleans, including the guy he was working for, a guy called Guy Bannister, and his mission, basically, was to get people to sign up and say they were communists and they were, you know, friendly to the cause, and he'd give names uh, to Guy Bannister and to Debris of the FBI. So that was his, uh, he, the mission he had in his head. So if you want a good sign of, uh, you know, definitely being intelligence connected, those were missions that he was on, and it, it's really clear. One, one more point. Does everybody know about Oswald's Saturday night phone call? Yeah, yeah. Set, somebody does? Terrific. Two? Oh, my God, I'm shocked. I need some pills. <laughs> 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 on Saturday night... Oswald is beginning to get the, the message that he's being set up for this thing, okay? He requests to make one phone call, all right? He wrote it out. It was to a guy named John Hurt. Now, the problem with this is John Hurt's in North Carolina, all right? How the hell would Oswald know about this guy? He was a former military intelligence officer, and it was near, relatively close, to the, what that's called the NAG's head base, which is where they trained naval defectors to go to Russia. All right? So when Oswald makes out this form to call John Hurt, the Secret Service is overseeing his phone calls. They tell the secretary, don't complete that call. <laughs> All right? And so the secretary dumps it in the garbage can. The other secretary, hmm, that's kind of interesting. When everybody leaves, she picks up the thing out of the garbage can. All right? And so that's how we know about that attempted phone call, which is an outgoing phone call. When Victor Marchetti used to work for the CIA, learned about this, he goes, uh-oh. He says, that attempted phone call, Oswald signed his own death warrant. All right? Very interesting. Speaking of the uh, JFK movie, one of the probably more, most unsettling and eerie moments that you show in the film, I'll start with you, Mr. Stone, if you want, um, is when you show those some 30 uh, police officers, police cars from the Dallas Police Department 
who converge, that all converge on the Texas theater, right, to arrest Oswald. Now, the only thing, as far as we know, and you show that in the movie, that he had done wrong was failing to pay his admission fee to go see a movie, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, can you expand on that? Yeah, it was a fascinating case. I didn't give you the details. All I can say is that I don't believe Oswald ever shot Tippett. Right. I think he went the police officer. The boarding house. Yep. He, got, he, got, he knew something was up, and he, he had an appointment at the movie theater with somebody. Right. That's what I think. And he got his gun. <laughs> so, you're talking about Oswald and the six cruiser cars at the Texas Theater? Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> six cruiser cars for a guy who didn't and pay admission. Johnny Brewer, too. The right, yeah, yeah, C okay, all right. Now, this is, uh, Oliver pointed this out in, in his film, in, in his 1991 feature film, and I think it's a very interesting, um, because there's a dispute over whether or not Oswald paid his ticket. All right, the girl at the front, Julia Postal, okay, said no. But the guy in the, in the Butch Burroughs, the guy who was a ticket taker said yes. Okay, all right. So, so, so did, we don't know. You know. Here's a dispute that never got, never got ironed out. All right. Now, there's also a dispute where he was sitting because the, there's two reports from the Dallas police. One, he's down on the first floor. The other one, he's in the balcony, all right? And, you know, this gets very interesting because a guy who was found out later, when he was shown pictures of uh, Oswald coming out the front, he said, that's the first time I've ever seen that. And he goes, but you, you live right across the street here. I go, yeah, Oswald came out the back, okay? I saw him coming out the back, you know? So this whole thing, can you say that again, Jim? I, I lost that. What? Can you say that point again? Make that point All right, okay. <coughs> this, this guy who lived right in the vicinity of the Texas Theater, all right, was shown a picture of Oswald being escorted out the front of the building. And this is like, I think, in the 1990s. And the guy goes, that's funny, because I've never seen that. I, I did, just learned of this because I thought he came out the I saw him come out the back, you know? so. Were there two Oswalds at the theater? We'll, we'll never know, of course, you know. But the, the thing that's really interesting is that a girl who lived across the street of the Texas theater, and she was running a photo shop, her mother, no, she called her mother, who happened to be running the boarding house that Oswald was staying at. This was just shortly after Oswald was, came out the front. She calls up her mother and says, you know that guy who's staying with you? He's being escorted out of the front of the Texas theater. And she goes, that's really funny because the FBI is here already. <laughs> How did the FBI know on God's green earth that Oswald was being escorted out when nobody even knew his damn name at that time. Excuse me for the profanity, I'm kind of angry, okay? You know, how, how does something like that happen? And, and how does something like that never get reported until 30 years later? You know, and that's, you know, that's the tragedy of this case, you know? Speaking of reporting, uh, unless you wanted to add something, Paul. No, that, that no? I think says it all. Says it all, okay. Speaking of actually reporting stuff that probably should not have been reported, in the JFK movie, at the heart of the movie, there's this classic sequence, right, with X, later revealed to be uh, Colonel uh, uh, Protrick, right? And he basically, and this is very brief, that's why I would like for you to expand on this. He talks about how details regarding Oswald, his file, his background, his arrest, were made public in places like New Zealand, some 24 hours, not even 24 hours after he was arrested, right? He said newspaper story. Yes. Now, right, which obviously draws uh, legitimate suspicions, right? Because there is no way on earth, normally, absent some coordinated plot and propaganda campaign, that this sort of detailed information would have been made public in a place as far away as New Zealand. Yes. Can you, can you expand on that? Yeah. 
I don't know all the time zone differences, but he's in New Zealand on the South Pole trip. He sees the story, and he knows right away that it's a prepared story. Right. It's a cover story. Because the hours, the differences in time between New Zealand and uh, Christchurch and uh, Washington, D.C. Right. That was his point. Cover story. In, in, in Seth Cantor's book, Who Was Jack Ruby?, Seth Cantor was a reporter who was in Dallas that weekend. He said that he saw Ruby at Parkland Hospital, which yeah. is the last thing the Warren Commission wanted to hear. Okay? <laughs> and so they disregarded his testimony. He was very upset about this thing, and he set out to write a book about to tell his side of the story. He was puzzled by this phenomenon also. How the heck did all this information about this obscure guy get into the media so fast, you know, within an hour, maybe two. And so uh, he traced it to a guy named Hal Hendricks, a reporter named Hal Hendricks, all right, that was the first guy to get all this information into the media, all right? UPI it turns... A UPI guy. Uh, no, I... I you, Miami. I, no, I think he was. You might be right. Yeah, yeah. And so, who is Hal Hendricks? Hal Hendricks ends up being one of the big media outlets for Richard Helms, who ended up being the director of the CIA. And so, if you don't know this, you know, if you think our media is Simon Pure, they're only doing their duty, you know, it's not really true. A lot of these, a lot of these reporters get paid you know, to do this side work for the CIA and the FBI. Carl Bernstein wrote an article about this in, I believe, 1978 for Rolling Stone, you know, which outlined all the reporters who were on the take by the CIA. So in a situation like this, where you want to get out a cover story as fast as you can, these guys come in very handy, okay, as they did in this particular case. Uh, Fletcher Prouty also is a really important source for researchers to explain how security was so lax mm -hmm. that day. I mean, you know, In you Dallas. had a guy with, oh, it was crazy. I mean, you had a guy with an umbrella open, that should never have happened. <laughs> you had open windows. You had a motorcade that took a, a, an illegal turn, an illegal turn, too sharp, that forced it to slow down. So uh, I, he was someone that was extremely high up. He knew Alan Dulles. He knew um, uh, Lansdale, right? He also, I'd, I don't know if you know the picture, the three tramps. You know, does that picture ring a bell? It's an incredible picture. And Fletcher Prouty is convinced, and not just him, but one of his colleagues, that one of the people in that picture walking in the opposite direction of the three tramps is Ed Lansdale. Now, who's Ed Lansdale? He's one of the guys who sets up scenarios, for example, the Vietnam War, or he'll, he's one of the people who, who, I mean, he's an ex-ad guy. I know a little bit about advertising, <laughs> but, so, but these people make up stories, okay, and storylines. And, and uh, I'm sorry, Paul, just one second. Yes. He's the one who uh, headed Operation Mongoose, right? Mongoose was him, basically. Yeah. 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 This is, uh, you, you, go ahead. You can explain. Yes, that's right. So uh, Operation Mongoose was actually... Uh, you know, I would say one of the first terrorism programs, uh, you know, right out of the U.S. And uh, he was in charge of training Cuban exiles, uh, you know, so that they go back, you know, I mean, hitting airliners. Uh, you name it. Uh, they, they would do anything, uh, uh, drop bombs on Cuban crops. There's even uh, a Canadian travel agency that got hit by a bomb. And they traced it to the Cuban exiles because Canada did not embark on the embargo with uh, Cuba. And uh, the Cuban exiles and those who were anti-Castro did not like that. So anyway, uh, Ed Lansdale was a, I mean, sorry, Fletcher Prouty was such an important source, uh, you know, for researchers. And he knew the big picture. You know, he knew the whole big picture, how you're going to do a regime change. Uh, if you look at what happened in Dallas, it's a regime change but it's by sort of the same perpetrators who do regime changes around the world, as the church committee revealed. So I, I, I think Fletcher Prouty is one of the key, key sources. 
Yes. I would qualify that. Yeah. Because I've heard so much. Fletcher, of course, talk, told us a lot about Ed. Lan he always suspected Ed Lansdale was there at the at Dealey Plaza because of the, there's a vague photograph and there's a mm -hmm. ring on his finger, which is ONI, I believe, Office of Naval Intelligence. And Fletcher really directed a lot of venom at Lansdale, and I never understood why. And then over the years, you know, you hear about that operation. Mongoose was a failure, complete failure. And the CIA was undermining it from the beginning because they didn't believe that Lansdale had any business in a paramilitary operation that they were organizing. That was their deal. They were hiring people like Johnny Roselli and uh, Sam Giancana. They were doing their thing in Cuba. And they resented this because Kennedy was trying to control the experiment, the assassinations of all that shit by focusing it in Mongoose. So Mongoose was the anti was it was the opposite of what the CIA really wanted. They wanted it to fail. So I've never been able to find anything on Lansdale relating him to the assassination. Mm -hmm. uh, you would read about him. He's a different kind of individual. He doesn't fit into the CIA operation. Doesn't fit into the picture, in my opinion. Opinion only. I, I, I wouldn't... I'd like yeah. to well, according to John Newman, once JFK fired Alan Dulles. Okay, uh, Lansdale lost the guy who was the most help to him in the CIA. And according to John, this is when Lansdale then gravitated over to the Pentagon. All right, once he lost his sponsorship. Now, one important thing to remember about Lansdale, if you saw the film last night, uh, Lansdale was one of the early sponsors of Northwoods. Okay, he's one of the first guys to bring it up. This, of course, was the false flag operation that was supposed to initiate an American invasion of Cuba. Now, the problem with that, as John says in his book, JFK made it very clear from the beginning. Mongoose was not going to involve direct American intervention in Cuba. And I have no intention of invading Cuba. So when these guys on the, like Lansdale on the Joint Chiefs, when they start bringing this stuff up, Kennedy goes through the roof, all right? And he ends up firing Lemnitzer, okay, from his job because Lemnitzer said, I don't even think we need an excuse. Why don't we just invade the island? And Kennedy throws up his arm and says, what the hell am I doing here? You know, and, and so he fires him. The mistake he made was that, uh, that he let the Joint Chiefs station him over as, as, as the chief of NATO in Europe, just the way he thought he got rid of William Harvey, the CIA guy, when in fact Helms very closely and guardedly shipped him over to Rome, Italy, instead. So these guys who really despised Kennedy are still around, you know, at, at the time of his assassination. And uh, to show, I said this last night, but if you weren't there last night, one of the, and this is in the long version, to show you how much these guys hated JFK. You know, on the day of the assassination, LeMay, Curtis LeMay, the chief of the Air Force, J, junior, uh, no, he wasn't, he was the chief of the Air Force on the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff. You know, he flies in, he lies about where he is, he's actually flying in from your country, Canada, when he's supposed to be in Michigan, what he was doing in Canada, nobody knows. He refuses to answer his uh, chief aide, Dorman, as on his way in. And you can hear this right on the Air Force One tapes. General LeMay, where are you? General LeMay, what's your destination? Doesn't answer. He then breaks orders. Instead of coming into Andrews Air Force Base, is where Kennedy body comes in, and all the cameras are there, he goes to National Airport, which is closer to Bethesda. All right, Paul O'Connor, who's in the morgue, all right, he's assisting James Humes, who's the chief pathologist. Humes says, tell that guy over there in the but gallery to the put that cigar out. He had all the smoke in the room yeah. <laughs> while he's trying to do an autopsy. So okay. He sends O'Connor over. O'Connor <laughs> finds this guy smoking a cigar, and it's LeMay. So, Mr. Sir, would you mind putting it out? <laughs> 
So Connor goes over. He blows the smoke in O'Connor's face. <laughs> <laughs> That's his answer. He kept smoking. O'Connor goes back. Connor goes back. Connor goes back. Connor goes back. Right. And he tells, tells Humes, I can't tell him to put that cigar out. That's General LeMay. Okay. So what was LeMay? That's, that's an added dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> what was LeMay doing there that night? Yeah. It, again, it's a question that we're never going to be able to resolve yeah. because nobody ever asked that question yeah. while he was alive. Yeah. Uh, that whole thing bothers me, though, because LeMay, obviously, there was a sense of gloating. Here's a naked man, your opponent, naked, cut up. Autopsy is disgusting, and he's. I mean, if anything, you can feel if you want to kill somebody, that's certainly a way of proving that you have done it. Uh, on the other hand, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they were split. There was people uh, like the Marine Shoop was pro Kennedy in his policies, so there was Arlie Burke was very anti Kennedy. There was all kinds of divisions in that group, so it, it doesn't work to approach the Joint Chiefs of Staff as a as a whole. It has to be done. You use the Joint Chiefs for weaponry, for paramilitary uh, cooperations, a plane here, a plane there. That's how you use them for. And these Cubans existed by themselves, the mob exists by themselves. How much do you really need the military to help you on this? It's just a question because I think the CIA is quite capable with their, all their experience of handling this themselves. These people inside. That's why I have a problem with this Joint Chiefs uh, stuff. Oliver, what about the great scene in your movie, in your, the, your feature, where you have Johnson standing in front of the Joint Chiefs of Staff saying, scene, just, just get me elected, okay, and I'll give you your war. It's not to imply that he's guilty. Johnson, I believe, was involved in a cover-up. I, I don't believe he was involved. No, 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 that's what I mean. Yeah, but he, that doesn't... It, sh it sure means the Joint Chiefs were... Uh, Listen, they wanted the war. They wanted the that war for so much, and they requested it in Laos and then in Vietnam. So finally, he's a, here's a guy who's coming into office. You know, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. That's what he's telling me. And, bu and by the way, you know, they did everything they could, Oliver, in 1991, 1992. And they even said that that scene never... Does everybody know what I'm talking about? D there's a scene in black and white where Johnson's talking to the Joint Chiefs and he says, just get me reelected and I'll give you your war. And they try to say that that didn't happen. They try to say that didn't happen. It's right in Stanley Carnell's book, who wrote a book called Vietnam, a history or something like a television history. And they, you, PBS used that book as a basis for a 24 part mini, documentary miniseries. So talk about being hoisted on your own petard, you know? <laughs> You're going to broadcast that on national television, then you're going to deny that it happened because Oliver Stone puts it in his movie? You know, but that's what these guys are like. <clears throat> and, and this touches memo 263 or 273, right? That This is the same scene that we're talking about. Yeah. Can we uh, make sure everyone here is aware of that memo and the enormous historical implications of that memo? Which memo are you talking about? Either 263 or 273. 263? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's Jay Fletcher probably brought that to my attention. I never heard of one of the National Security Action Memorandum right. until he brought it up. And, of course, John Newman has followed up. And Jim, this is a, don't make it too complicated. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, that's exactly what happened. Fletcher brought it to Oliver, okay? And then John Newman came in later and... We brought John Newman in. We, we, we actually... Arranged. Yeah, you, you brought John Newman in, right? We brought him in as an advisor, and then we arranged for him to get the book published via that corrupt... Right, right. Brothers, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> they, they didn't do anything for the book, right? What? They didn't do anything for the book. No, they didn't. They sandbagged the book. Right. Okay. Um, NSAM 263 uh, begins with a mission over to... Vietnam by McNamara uh, and Max Taylor, who by this time is a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Kennedy has made it clear to McNamara, crystal clear for over a year, that we're getting out of here, okay? And in fact, Roswell Kirkpatrick, who was McNamara's assistant, later revealed in oral history that McNamara had told him Kennedy's given me instructions to start winding this thing down, all right? 
And so what happens is McNamara collects all the schedules from all the departments over in Vietnam, the State Department, the CIA, Pentagon, all right, puts them together, and they're going to go ahead and withdraw. But Kennedy wants a report that will justify the withdrawal. So he sends McNamara and Taylor over. And this report is not written by any of these guys on this mission. There's a back channel between the White House, okay, and the Secretariat doing the report, and they're doing it, all right, so that it's a fait accompli once it gets back, all right, because Bobby Kennedy's supervising this thing, all right. And so when they see the report, Taylor wants to take the withdrawal order, NSAM 263, out of the report. When Kennedy sees this, he calls them all into his office, all right. He himself puts it back in, okay, to the report. It's not coming out, all right. And then he more or less has to, like, bulldoze the rest of his staff, you know, convince them that we're getting out of here. And NSAMP 263 is the first step. We're going to withdraw 1,000 uh, advisors. And this is, this is what you have to remember. There are no combat troops in Vietnam under Kennedy. None. Okay? It's all advisors. They're not there. He did not want combat troops anywhere near Vietnam. So Kennedy pushes this through his staff, all right? And then he tells McNamara, go out and announce it. And there's an incredible scene where McNamara is walking out the door and Kennedy puts up a window and he says, tell him that means the helicopters also, <laughs> all right? Okay, so I don't think it gets any more clear than that. And that was gonna be the first step to complete the withdrawal by 1965. And why that? Because Kennedy was very worried that, and he even said this, that if I do this before the election of 64. and Vietnam falls, of 64, the election of 1964. Yeah. yeah, so I have to do this around the election. You know, so Goldwater, whoever it is, can't blast away at me, okay, during the summer of 1964. That's why he did it that way. Well, if I just uh, wanted to bring up um, one point, about 10 years ago, I did an analysis on how history books cover the Kennedy era. And, 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 can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, so I did an analysis on how history books, uh, you know, relate the Kennedy assassination and how they describe Kennedy. And they say it's a lone nut in most history books. And they, uh, they say that uh, Kennedy was a warmonger, that he was a cold warrior. And that's in our history books. And I know an awful lot of us are teachers here, or ex-teachers. And I find that just a shame, that you know, you just throw something out like that, and we're teaching that to 15, to kids 15 to 19, 20, 22 years old. That's what you see in the history books. Now, I even questioned the authors through email. And I said, well, what do you base yourself on to say this? Uh, the Warren Commission. Now, most of them don't even know that there were five other government inquiries. Okay, including the Church Committee, the House Select Committee on Assassinations. They don't know about Garrison. They don't know about the ARB. So they didn't know about that. So they're just repeating what the Warren Commission parroted. I uh, promised a two-part event with a uh, about five to ten minute break in between. We're about an hour in, so I figure this is probably a good time to pause. Yes, absolutely. So let's give ourselves ten minutes. We'll be back. Okay. So. Two questions before the Q&A with the audience. The first one, we, uh, we briefly alluded to Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy earlier in the first part. And towards the very end of the JFK movie, there's, there's talk uh, from uh, Jim Garrison during the trial scene that both murders, bo both assassinations, were basically presented to the mass public very, in, in very similar way to the way that the Kennedy, the John F. Kennedy assassination was presented, right, by lone, crazed men. This seems to imply that there might have been larger plots 
in both of those uh, cases as well. Is this how you view uh, things or not? Yeah, I always have. Okay. I've always viewed it that way because it's so absurd. The the uh, the, the three stories are things written by Hollywood scriptwriters. I met James Earl Ray before he died. He came. I saw him in prison. And he was a most innocuous man. I mean, he really didn't have a sense of what happened to him. He didn't. There was a na native-born innocence about him. I have to say, it just for him to plot out this thing going to Africa, going up to the Canada and Raoul and all this stuff. It's it's probably right. <laughs> there was a lot going on, and uh, you have to investigate this Raoul because it's a key figure. Same thing with King. Uh, I mean, not with uh, Robert Kennedy. What an insane story. Sirhan Sirhan. As you know, there was a parole hearing. They wanted to let him out, and uh, the uh, part of the Kennedy family attacked uh, the, uh, the Kennedy girl, uh, forgot her name, was very adamant about not getting... Poor Sirhan was completely mind-washed. I mean, he was, he was a, he's a case for hypnosis, totally. And it was clear at the time that was their method. So I think you have to look there. Uh, and the, you have to look at the guy who's sa standing right behind Robert Kennedy, Ro uh, Thane Cesar, with his, and the amount of bullets, the walls, the evidence, so badly done, LAPD, again, completely screws up. Robert Kennedy, who, who worked with us, expressed, expresses his disgust with that case. Because Robert was going to reopen the case. This is really what he was going to do. And it was clear to those inside who knew that. You mean the JFK case? JFK case, yes, because it, it ties into him, his own case. Mm -hmm. And, of course, they knew that. They, they knew that that was coming, and you cannot let that JFK case reopen. You cannot let that reopen. It, it would undo America. Jim or Paul? Well, he, uh, Oliver knows a lot about the King case because he did a lot of work on that. I did a lot of work on the Robert Kennedy case, and I've always found it's much easier to show people that the RFK case was a conspiracy than the JFK case was. The JFK case will take you a couple minutes, all right? The uh, RFK case will take you about 30 seconds, so let's go ahead to it. Stand up, Paul. Okay, Paul, Paul no, face me, face me. Paul is RFK. RFK is 5'10 and a half. I'm Sirhan. Okay, I'm about 5'4. Uh, okay, so if I'm standing right here, where would you think all the bullets would hit? In, in this area, right? Chest and shoulder area. What if I told you not one bullet hit there? Not one bullet hit in that area. Every bullet that comes in to Bobby Kennedy comes in behind at an extreme upward angle and at a point contact range, which means one to three inches. The, the bullet that kills him in the, in the skull, okay, has very deep, what they call uh, powder burns, okay? So in other words, the gun had to be like right about here for that shot. Well, go ahead, sit down. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> All right, so how could, Sirhan, how could Sirhan have killed Bobby Kennedy? You know, no, every single witness puts him in front of Bobby Kennedy, <laughs> all right? But everybody thinks that that's an open and shut case. One of the most moving moments in our film, which I'm not sure if it made it into the final cut, Bobby Kennedy was there. And I was, my job was to sit next to Oliver, okay, and tap him on the shoulder you know, whenever I had a suggestion, okay? And so, and so we're almost done with Bobby Kennedy, and I tapped Oliver on his shoulder, and I said, ask him if he thinks the assassination of his father is related to the assassination of his uncle, all right? And Oliver asked that question, and how Bobby Kennedy did not cry when he answered that question, it was so moving you know, such a moving moment that, movie. that even, even Robert Richardson, who is a director of photography, he's looking through the camera after it's over. He says words to the effect, <laughs> pretty goddamn powerful, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> and then I said, 
how the hell did he not cry when he was saying that stuff? And Rob Richardson said, he did tear up because he's looking through the camera, okay? And so when I looked at the outtakes, he did tear up. It was a very moving moment, you know, the, during the whole, you know, shoot, you know. I'm really glad we got him in the film. In the long version, he's in even more. Uh, sorry, I'm just getting my senses back. I don't <laughs> like it when an American <laughs> pretends to shoot me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, let me just say this. Did you feel this. like I was one of those gun nuts? Oh, <laughs> you all are, so, you know. Um, <laughs> but anyway, let me just say this. Uh, first of all, the House Select Committee on Assassination didn't just analyze the Ken uh, John Kennedy assassination. It also analyzed the Martin Luther King assassination. And they concluded in both cases that there was a probable conspiracy, I think. Yes. Okay. And, but the easiest one to prove, in fact, is the Robert Kennedy one. And I agree with that because the, the guy who did the autopsy, Noguchi, was the best in, in the U.S., was he not? And it was At, uh, Cyril Wecht said Noguchi's autopsy report on Bobby Kennedy was the most complete, comprehensive autopsy report he ever read in his whole career. So what happened to him? <laughs> he got kicked out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and by the way, who did they bring in, Jim? He had to sue to get his job back. And who did they bring in? <laughs> Didn't they bring in Boswell? Uh, no, Fink. They brought in Fink, who was right. one of the three. One who, of the three. Three who were part of the autopsy for JFK. So they brought him as, you know, reinforcement. They did a sub another autopsy. I don't know the full extent, Jim. Maybe uh, I'm not an expert on Bobby Kennedy, but what? Uh, did, he did they do another autopsy? No. No. Report? No, his, his is the only autopsy report. And he and he makes a big deal about saying he makes a big deal whenever you interview him about this, he says, I have never said that Sirhan Sirhan killed Bobby Kennedy. Okay? That's how he'll answer that question. Because he doesn't believe it himself. All right. <laughs> Remarkable. Before we uh, move on to the uh, q and I know Paul wanted to show something. If we have a clip up on the screen. Yeah. Yes, I think that the uh, last film that he made, the agent said we finally got him. I, I think that was absolutely correct. Now, when they arrested me on on uh, May the 18th, that was the attitude of the state's attorney, Henry Hand, and the special agent in charge, Mr. Martin. And that summed up the whole thing, and I think it made an impression on the public. And that spurred that helped to create the atmosphere for President Biden to take action on my part. I really do. And I thank Oliver Stone for what he did. And I, I thank and I praise him for bringing forth the facts about the Kennedy assassination. I really do. I think it that his movies, his films, are true. And he did his best to bring before the American people the truth about the assassination of our president. And I appreciate that very much. I'm, I'm not sure if either Jim or Mr. Stone, you want to comment on who Abraham Bolden is, what he represents. He was set as the first black agent. Uh, John Kennedy at his inauguration noticed that he didn't have anybody in the Secret Service that was black. <laughs> so he, went, he made a special point to hire black employees for the federal government. He made it actually a law, it went, it went a contract law, I don't know how they did it, but he ended up hiring black people for into the U.S. government in all these departments. Bolden was the first in, into the Secret Service, and he was always, I suppose, suspected by the old Secret Service as some kind of plant. You know, I don't think they ever liked him or trusted him. He was involved in the Chicago office. Uh, Paul can tell you more. He 
he, he writes about how scandalous a, an investigation it was of these Cubans didn't do their job and of course he was busted a few years later. Tell him the story, it's a good story. Well, uh, yeah, uh, one of the articles I wrote for Jim, which got me to be interviewed in the documentary was about prior plots, attempts to assassinate Kennedy. And what I, I was demonstrated in that article is that there's a template. Okay, a template, and that template always includes, or often includes, a patsy that's very similar to Oswald, many of which did that insane uh, act of trying to represent the fair play for Cuba committee, to blame it on Castro. The Chicago plot took place about three weeks before the assassination, and the, uh, the person, one of the Secret Service people in Chicago was Abraham Bolden. And he was such an important witness for the lax security, how they botched uh, uh, an, assa an assassination attempt that would have seen four Latino snipers come up and kill Kennedy. They, they picked up two of them and they interrogated them. But we don't even have their pictures. We don't have their names. I mean, uh, if you can uh, believe that, that's absolutely amazing. Then they found an alternate patsy in the name of a guy called Thomas Arthur Valley. This poor guy uh, trained Cuban exiles. He had mental problems. He was in the Marines. He was in the Far East. And what did they do just shortly before the motorcade in Chicago was supposed to happen? They move him from Long Island to Chicago and they place him in a six floor building right at the perfect place for a crossfire. Okay, so that's some of the stuff that uh, Abraham Bolden witnessed. And the other thing he witnessed was lax security. Uh, he also witnessed orders not to uh, talk ever about the Chicago plot. So about a year later, when the Warren Commission is, uh, he wanted to talk to them and say what he knew. And th when they found that out, he got stopped, railroad into the jail, and he did six years in jail. And uh, the, the, the thing that's amazing about the documentary is you heard Abraham Bolden thank Mr. Stone for making the movie, which got him a, bar a pardon, what, a month ago? Yes. A a yeah. About a month ago. So the importance of Abraham Bolden we would never know about the Chicago plot if it weren't for him. Because when the ARB started up, what did the Secret Service start doing? Shredding all the files on prior plots. And there were many of them. Many of them. There was one in Tampa a few days before. There was one attempt in Los Angeles. There was a plan for something in Washington. And they all revealed a template. So this template was so similar to what happened in Dallas that that shows something, you know, central or coordinated planning. So that's the importance of Abraham, Bo of Abraham Bolden. So we have about 20 minutes, uh, so we'll move to the Q&A. I will ask everyone who wants to ask a question to please be brief in their question. The only person, and I mean this, who can take as much time as he wants is Jim, okay? <laughs> so, okay, so by show of hands, um, Monsieur Lemelin, je crois c'est possible de lui apporter un micro. So I have a, a specific question. If we have time, I will have a larger question in scope, but uh, for, for, the, for the moment, my specific question. Uh, in your interesting uh, documentary, Mr. Stone, uh, you mentioned that following the Bay of Pigs fiasco, three prominent members of the CIA were dismissed by President Kennedy. The first one, naturally, the chairman, Alan Dulles, the second one, Richard Bissell. But the last one, the deputy director of the CIA, uh, his name is Charles Cable. And it seems to me very interesting to know that his brother was the mayor of Dallas on November, in November 1963. We know that his brother, the mayor of Dallas, Earl Cable, uh, apparently rerouted the presidential motorcade at the last minute. Uh, I suppose you also include Earl Cable, the mayor of Dallas, uh, in the conspiracy? Yes, it's mentioned in the movie back in 91. It's mentioned in the movie back in 91. 
But this whole parade route story is fascinating. I think we need to get a, cl a clear explanation from Mr. D. Eugenio as to how the fuck it got changed. <laughs> <laughs> and why and so forth. Because I've heard 17 versions of it, including, I told you more recently, that the, ex eg the egress is not the same on, on, on Houston. Is it Houston? No, Elm, on Elm. No, no, the, it's, the, according to Vince Palomero, it was changed in 1994. And the Dallas okay. police got an, an escort as to where it was going to go this time. Okay. okay. Fill it, fill it in. In, in, the mic. Just in the mic. Make it exciting. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, I'm sorry, Jim, with, your, with the mic. With the, with the mic. Microphone. microphone. With the mic. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's not true that that was the only way to get to the destination, that you had to go through that double turn it's not true and the house select committee found that out all right so what happened is the night before the dallas police were taken out and shown what the actual route was going to be for the first time all right and so anybody can tell you that that is uh, uh, against every rule there is you know now oliver pointed out in this film that the Cabell brothers, the one who got fired, Charles Cabell, was the brother of the mayor uh, in Dallas. What he didn't know, what the ARB declassified several years later, is that the brother who is the mayor was also a CIA asset. Okay? That was not declassified till I think about 2003 or 2004. And you want, you want to know the capper on that one? The reason... The reason it was not declassified, because it was said to be not directly related, okay? That's the term they had, okay? Now, I don't see how you can get much more related than that, okay? You know, but we, we asked Thunheim about this, you know, and he said, I'm sorry, but we just had to do that with a lot of these papers because we couldn't get through them all. So that's how it ended up being not directly related. Another question. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're coming. <laughs> no, 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 but okay. we're going to use the mic. Yeah. So, well, of course, the JFK movie and documentary are central part in your work. That's what we've been talking about. But I'd like to know how you relate those two films to your other body of work. I mean, you've done lots of things on real, you, real history, well, Snowden, Ukraine, Putin. I won't talk strictly about that unless you want to talk about it, of course. <laughs> but I mean, may, where is GFK? Where are those two films in your whole body of work on your? Uh, well, for me, it's I'm sorry with it. <laughs> it's this is an accident. Accident. I mean, by the way, I stumbled into this thing as a naive idiot. A useful idiot, as which I am, in any way. Uh, I, it was a hell of a murder case. A woman in, a, in Havana, Ellen Ray, who those of you who know her from Sheridan Press, gave me this book uh, that Jim had just written, On the Trail of the Assassins. It was his second be revisit. Heritage of Stone was his first book in 68, 69. He wrote this one in 87 or 88. She gave it to me in the elevator. You know, I said, oh, you know, another fucking nutcase in the elevator, and uh, <laughs> which I get quite a lot of. And I read it. I mean, I, she had. A, she was really strong. She'd been at the trial in '69. She was very strong, and I listened. It, you know, and over the course of the next two, three months, I think it was in the Philippines when I was making Born the Fourth of July. I read the book. Hell of a book. Great story. But I wasn't researching it. I was believing everything I read, like, you know, boom. And it's great, too good to pass up. It sounds like Z. You know, Z, the, 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 the murder happens, and uh, Costa Gavras explains what really happens beneath the layers of the murder. And it's the same story for me. I, I saw the movie, in, in, in a way, the, the onion skin coming undone. Uh, then I met Jim, and I met Fletcher, and I started to meet the people around the case. And it became more and more passionate for me. And I invested, as you know, quite a bit of time. And eventually, my reputation. Uh, didn't realize what I was getting into. Didn't realize what it was such. It was, I thought it was kind of over, you know. 
it, that it was an over it, it was over and done with that the 70s had been relatively quiet after the HSCA and here we were into 91 the 80s had been quiet rather so this thing came as a shock and as Jim pointed out I spent almost nine months after the film was released which was my first experience defending the film in other words there was no time to for me to make another film I was so busy you know fighting for my honor uh, which, uh, you know, is hard to win when you, have the when you have the establishment against you and stayed that way for a long time. By the way, I just, uh, those of you who don't know, when our film came out, the documentary, last year, what month was it? What? What month? <laughs> <laughs> what month? <laughs> what month did we bring it out? November? Oh, forget it. When we <laughs> came out last year, the American media mainstream media ignored it completely completely there was hardly nothing i saw on tv or in press everything was given to us was underground or uh, non-mainstream a lot of internet stuff all positive all good but nothing from the mainstream nothing so it's a different world in 19 in 2020 than it is in 1991 right it certainly was a different Although it was bad then, it seems to be worse now. And now you're not even allowed to say what you think. So your question was what? About all my other career. <laughs> so as you can see, that has a large impact on your rest of your career. But uh, so I've always been conscious of it, but I've moved on. You know, you have to be strong here and don't get stuck. Uh, uh, don't defend yourself, over, over defend yourself. You know, some filmmakers would have said, oh, it's only a movie, don't worry about it. And that might have been a smart response, but it wasn't the way I felt. I felt very strongly that we were correct and that the government was lying. And I didn't realize that by insulting the government, what I was taking on, I was a bit naive, like Jim in his, in his way. <laughs> like Jim was. Jim had no idea what he was gonna go through. He was a patriot, he'd served two wars, a good man. I liked him. I thought he, you know, obviously oh, we all, no one's perfect, but he was a good man. In fact, he was so hurt by this case that when I first approached him, and Ellen was our, was our go-between, he was so sensitive to anything I said that was negative about the case that he was ready to jump on me. Uh, he was like a, in other words, like a war veteran who had been a, a grenade had landed too close to his mind. He just, he, he was very nervous about the case and hated it, hated it, but loved it. It was his life. He came back, you know, he was completely discredited by the trial and then he was busted by, again, I think the CIA was involved for a, f some law case because New Orleans is the most corrupt place I've ever seen. And the, all these law people are hilarious. They, they all, they're snakes in a, in, a, in a pit. And there's a lot of them went against Jim because of what he did, including Harry Connick, the future DA who destroyed some of his files. Uh, anyway, they got Jim on a case uh, of bribery in, in, Los, in Louisiana, but then he, it was repealed and he, he, he got out. He was out and then he came back as a judge. He was elected again, God damn it. The guy who was a fighter, six foot seven, the jolly green giant. Everywhere I went with him in New Orleans, on the street, everywhere. The people in the street, the street people loved him. They stopped him shook his hand, glad to meet you, especially the black people. They got it. The only, the people who hated him were in the establishment. The, uh, the, New, or the New Orleans newspapers, the richer people, the people who were embarrassed by him. He never set foot hardly in Jefferson Parish. He was always accused of, of being, uh, of being in, uh, of taking, being involved with Carlos Marcello, the famous gangster, who actually was a resident of Jefferson Parish. He was in New Orleans Parish, he had no, no jurisdiction in, Jeff in uh, Jefferson Parish, but he was always blamed for uh, his involvement with Marcello, which was another calumny that just doesn't hold up. So, uh, what, what was the question? How, <laughs> my how my does, other career. Yes. How can I have another career? No, <laughs> I loved my, my other career. I just concentrated on other, <laughs> other projects. History, uh, Alexander, uh, football, any given Sunday, Wall Street, all these other things. I didn't want to get stuck on one thing. 
uh, but I'm sure it'll be one of the first lines in my obituary. <laughs> <laughs> How I defrauded the public and all that stuff. <laughs> I mean, who, who, who would have made a movie like this, you know, uh, the feature film in 1991, especially in Oliver's at the peak of his career at that time, you know? And he went ahead and he decided to use that capital to do a, the great American murder mystery. N nobody else was going to touch that thing, you know, at that time, especially, you know, with all the bad things told about Jim Garrison, you know? But he went ahead and, and he did it, you know, and, you know, it's, it's very much, you know, talk about courage, you know, to, to go ahead and, and gamble everything, you know, on, a, on such a controversial subject, but a guy who's been dead for 30 years, you know, but, but he did. And that's, uh, who else makes movies like Natural Born Killers, like JFK, like Untold History? like South of the Border, like our film, JFK Revisited. Who else makes those kinds of movies in the United States? Hmm. Nobody that I know, you know. And to have such a consistent record like that and to have them come out as well as they did, you know. I, I was wondering if I might add, oh, sorry, do you want to? I, I just wanted to add a couple of things about that movie. First of all, it changed law. I mean, it created the ARRB. And what came out from the ARB vindicates Garrison. And uh, let me give you just two examples. Clay Shaw claimed that he had nothing to do with the CIA. And in the documents that came out, there are, we see that he was a well-paid well CIA asset, I think is the word. Contract. The second contract. thing, con contract yeah. agent. The second thing that came out that is absolutely clear is Clay Shaw and Oswald most likely met, okay, and had a relationship. And the third thing that is clear is that Jim Garrison's office was bugged and he was being, I mean, there was a, a huge, huge effort to discredit him. And that's what comes out of thanks to the change in law and thanks to the declassification, it vindicates, I think, both the movie JFK and Jim Garrison. Right. See, the scene in the, scene in the movie if you remember when, when uh, Kevin Costner is on the phone and the assistant tells him somebody bugged the office, that's another thing he was attacked for. It turns out Garrison's office was bugged twice, once by the CIA and once by the FBI. All right, and that's been declassified. So all these things that he's being criticized for is, ends up being true. Other questions? It's going to be the last one. Make it good. No pressure. Uh, okay. Um, this, one's for, this one is for Jim. Jim, I'm a big fan of your work, and I've, I've read both of your books twice. Uh, and my, my question is a bit obscure. It's from uh, Destiny Betrayed, and it's an issue you bring up, and I think it was also in uh, On the Trail of the Assassins and a f another book that I read. You mentioned this so-called mystery flight in 1963 that Clay Shaw... Uh, uh, the the mystery what? A mystery flight that Shaw, Ferry, and I'm not sure who else made to Montreal. Now, and in Montreal, there was someone called Louis Bloomfield, who had intelligence links and was uh, uh, an important guy in Permindex, and who may have had some links with the Mossad. Uh, I always found this uh, that pretty interesting, being from Montreal myself. Just wondering, has there been any further research into the possible you know, Montreal link to the JFK assassination? Actually, I'm actually going to write about that. <laughs> so you, <laughs> uh, a gentleman by the name of Mikel Meta, okay, who is from Italy, all right, did a, a pretty interesting book on Permindex, all right, and this is one of the things that he wrote about in his book. He since expanded the book. It came out originally at about 140 pages. He's expanded the book to 300 pages. So I'm going to be reading that book, you know, and I'm going to be talking about this particular issue because it does look like, like Bloomfield was a... I guess I should explain this. Permindex was a very mysterious uh, corporation that was suspected of being a CIA front. 
and they were kicked out of Switzerland, all right? And then they went ahead and they went to Rome, and they operated for a few years in Rome. And Clay Shaw was on the board of directors of Permindex, all right? And then they got kicked out of Italy, all right? And so Permindex was one of the things that, get, and this is what's so odd, Garrison could have used this against Shaw, but he never did. He never brought it up almost in any form, you know? And so this is one of the things I'm going to be looking into a little deeper about just how bad, you know, this, this mysterious Italian CIA Mossad Corporation actually was. All right, so thanks for letting me advertise that in advance. <laughs> okay. All right, I, I'm, I would bet good money that uh, most people here would go on for at least a few more hours, Jim being the first. So <laughs> unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, but I do want to thank everyone for coming here. And this includes, first and foremost, our three guests, Paul Blow, Jim DiEugenio, and obviously Oliver Stone. So thank you all. Thank you for coming. Even though you're directly related to one of the things. Well, you know what?